Okay, if you'll take your Bibles with me and turn to uh, Mark's Gospel, where we left off last week, uh, chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. If somebody get the light on, I'd appreciate it. That way I could read it. While you're turning there, let me share with you, two weeks from today, not next Sunday, but the next, is Palm Sunday, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. For two weeks from today, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. So I wanted you to be aware of that and make your plans for that. And before we read this passage, a question I'll ask you, a passage of Scripture, let me ask you a question. If Jesus were physically here today, and He is, in the presence of His people, were His body, were His arms, were His legs, His feet, were His nose, His ears, His mouth. If He was physically here today, how would Jesus do church? Ever thought about that? Would he come into the churches, our churches today, and do it very differently than what they look like today? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to see it from this passage this morning. So begin reading with me at verse 18. And let's see if we can pick out some principles here. And John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch on an unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch will pull away from it, and the new from the old, and a worse tear is the result. No one puts new wine into new wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost in the skins as well. No, one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. And it came about that as he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began making their way along by picking the heads of the grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, See here, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? That's kind of how they said it. And he said to them, Have you never read that when what David did when he was in need and became hungry, and he and his companions, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest? And then he gave it to those who were with him. And he was saying, and he was saying to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Consequently, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Okay, a perpetual conflict existed between Jesus and the keepers of the old wine bags, and it, it occurred because of the issue of this word, change. Few of us like it, most of us resist it. Change. In our text this morning that we just read, we discover there are two encounters that Jesus had uh, with the Pharisees or the religious establishment. In both of them, Jesus introduced the prospect of change and the keepers of the old wine bags stiffened their neck in resistance. Between these two encounters, in verse 22, go back and look at it with me. We're going to read it in a moment. Jesus uh, used an interesting metaphor to describe his effect on the religious establishment of his day. Read again verse 22, hear what he said. No one pours new wine into old wine bags. If he does, the wine will burst the bags, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into old wineskins. There's a reason for this. Uh, old wineskins were dry and brittle. They didn't adapt very well to new wine. New wine causes the old bag to stretch and crack and leak. Now, the legalistic Jewish religious establishment, of course, were the old wineskins, while the new wine represented the teachings of Jesus. Everybody got that, okay? The Pharisees were suffering from a case of hardening hardening of the spiritual arteries. 
They were flabbergasted that he would invite Levi, a corrupt tax collector. We looked at that last week to be one of his followers. They were astonished, taken aback, that he would touch and heal a social outcast. And he was aghast, they were aghast that he did not practice what I call the hyper-legalities regarding the Sabbath. There wasn't a Pharisee within miles who wouldn't give his last shekel to get rid of this threat to their brittle religious establishment. Now, folks, the name of the vital Christian life is spelled this way. C-H-A-N-G. Change. Everybody get that? Change. Now, I realize not all changes are good, but I also realize not all changes are bad. And some changes are not very good. But the transformation of an ugly, hostile spirit at war with God into a loving spirit of beauty is the goal of the Christian life. But transformation is always preceded by an inner change. Jesus kept challenging the rules, kept pushing the boundaries and the barriers thus creating an intense battle between himself and the religious establishment of his time. Nearly 450 years ago, the French government under King Charles IX moved New Year's Day back from April the 1st, where it had been for centuries, to January the 1st, where it has been ever since. And uh, needless to say, such a radical shift in something so basic evoked enormous social outcry. The old New Year's Day became a battleground between those who resisted the change and those who supported it. And guess what each group called the other in this particular conflict? If you guessed fool, you'd be right. Okay? The stand patterns watching people chase after every new fad and betray the past would express their contempt by calling them fools. And then the, same, the other group would return the compliment as they labeled as fools those who were restless and could not cope with the reality of change and flow with the times. And this, friends, is how April Fool's Day came into being, which we'll look at just three weeks from now. Change is something that's really difficult for folks. All of us have problems with change. Empress Catherine the Great of Russia strolled onto the palace grounds one early spring afternoon and uh, with snow still covering the ground, and she spotted an early spring flower trying to push its way up through the soil, trying to freeze the moment and protect the flower's growth. She flipped her finger told to her entourage, post a guard here. So for the next 150 years, no kidding, a guard was posted on that very smart, all four seasons of the year, one guy is guarding a very small spot of ground 365 days a year because of an early spring flower that took place 150 years before and or yet the impulsiveness of an autocratic ruler. Yep, tradition is really something difficult to deal with. On the other hand, growth, which is at the opposite end of the spectrum from tradition, presupposes change. In fact, for the growing person, there is nothing as permanent as change. But all this changing creates problems. New ways have to be found as old ways fail. New habits are formed as old ones are broken. And new attitudes are adopted as old ones die. Look at any problem in your life right now. Look at any problem in your life right now. And I will bet you that some change is part of the problem. There are many people today who want to be somebody or they want to make a difference in the world in which they live. But because growth requires change, they resist change because, as we all know, change is risky. What is truly ironic and tragic at the same time is that the church, ostensibly God's people, 
are oftentimes the ones who are the most unlikely to change. It's amazing, isn't it? At least I find it is. The very people in whom change should be a way of life are often the most resistant to it. That was indeed the Pharisees' problem, as Jesus pointed out to them here in our passage. Jesus threatened their power, their control, and their status in the church. And they just could not stand it. They did not want anyone to change the way things were, no matter how bad they were, and they refused to open their eyes and to see how bad they were, and they were happy with the status quo because they were in charge of the status quo. That was their most cherished value. Jesus was a change agent. He taught his disciples to be a change agent. And he established his church to be a change agent in the world. But you know what's happened? Rather than being a change agent in the world and producing change in our culture that more conforms to Christian values, churches are far more turned inside out by the culture than we are by the Spirit of God. We have capitulated the culture in a number of different areas, or we just stay the same trying to beg off all the changes that are taking place. We're resistant to change on the one hand. On the other hand, all the changes that are occurring in culture, we somehow just kind of quit fighting some of them, and we adopt them even though we have to violate certain principles in God's Word to do so. But that's part of the problem. Five decades ago, Everett Rogers wrote a groundbreaking book entitled The Diffusion of Innovation. After an exhaustive study about how change works, Rogers concluded that it takes an innovation roughly 30 years to penetrate the target audience, whatever that is. Now, his hypothesis was supported by the research of historian, author Schlesinger, who also discovered that political and cultural changes are like a pendulum swinging back and forth in a 30-year cycle. Now, many people in churches believe that if any change is going to occur in a church, then it must be done over a long period of time. More recent research indicates that shows that the blizzard of technological change that has insinuated it in our lives over the last 20 years or so, has constricted the change cycle to somewhere nearer two to five years. Translation, we don't have 30 years to catch up with changes anymore. Millions and millions of people today are struggling to deal with life right now because they live under this old way of thinking, I'll get used to this and I'll understand it at some point in the future without realizing we don't have the luxury of time to ease into new ideas. And yet many people in churches believe that we do. And so we resist change. And for this reason, there are many churches that are dying by the truckloads. And that's a real tragedy. Church, as the way Jesus did it, is a church that will constantly, at least, be open to changing everything that we do to be more effective in reaching people with the gospel and ministering in the marketplace. Asterisk. And we can do this, and we should do this, without compromising critical beliefs that change in the church should not be driven by the culture. It should be driven by the Spirit of God and what the Word of God teaches instead of capitulating to the culture's new ideas. Well, secondly, church the way that Jesus did it inspired trust rather than the trappings of tradition. Trust rather than the trappings of tradition. The subject here in this passage that we just read a few moments ago was fasting. And the Pharisees' question basically was, why don't you fast Jesus? Now, fasting, understand, was a religious law that was only required one 
time a year, but was recommended for four other times when the Jews celebrated certain uh, religious festivals or holidays. But none of those events were taking place at this time when the, when the Pharisees confronted Jesus. However, it had been established by the Pharisees, not God, by the Pharisees as a tradition that Mondays and Thursdays should be days that people should fast, and Thursdays was market day. So the Pharisees had this practice. They had a little game they play. Religious people do this a lot. Here's a little practice they had. On Thursdays, because everybody's at the marketplace, they would go and wind their way down through the main street of market or the marketplace, bringing attention to themselves by shouting out loud praises to God, and they would intentionally make themselves look worn and haggard, wearing ashes in their hair, which always went along with fasting because it, fasting and mourning went together, in order to show people outwardly just how really spiritual they were. Jesus, of course, wasn't into the game of impressing people, and so he refused to play. Jesus answered their inquiry, though. I want you to see this in this text. Look at it. He answered their inquiry about fasting by asking a question of his own regarding another tradition, the Jewish wedding celebration. Essentially, he asked, you haven't been to a wedding celebration where food was non-existent, have you? The answer is obviously no, because as a matter of fact, marriage celebrations in that time were of such a special nature that wedding parties could and often did last all week long. Certain religious laws and customs were suspended and people were even ha could even miss work. And for many folks, this was a rare break from literally bone-crushing work. A man would be crazy to fast during such a festive time. The bride and the groom would never be forgiven for not providing a feast to be remembered. Jesus, in this passage that we just read a moment ago, likened himself to the bridegroom and his descendants to the attendants, I mean his disciples to the attendants, family, and friends in the wedding party. His message was essentially this. I'm here. I am the Messiah. This is a time for rejoicing, not mourning, which was often associated with fasting. They can fast all they want when I'm gone. Jesus' heart was not set on fire by the tedious traditions of the religious establishment. Did nothing for him, and frankly, it didn't do a whole lot for the people either. The Pharisees, however, were clothed in ritual and traditions. They not only desired to keep the 613 legitimate commandments given of the law, but the whole body of oral tradition as well, which could fill volumes. On the matter of what you could and could not do on the Sabbath, there were 39 separate categories at, at that of work that was strictly prohibited down to the minutest detail, how far you could walk, you know, how, if you couldn't make it to the kitchen because you exceeded the number of feet, then you couldn't kill, cook anything, and then cooking really was outlawed anyway on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees' appetite, appetite for tradition stemmed from their obsession with controlling the religious activity of the people. The threatened person is one who enjoys safeguards, who needs control to limit variety. The pharisaic tendency to weigh down people with policy created a massive bureaucracy that served as a major contributor to their stumbling over Jesus. Their traditions were protections from the new, the creative, the fresh, and tragically, the truth. The church today, often labors under the same weighty burden and a bureaucracy, thus causing us to miss new and creative ways of fulfilling our mission. In fact, the real challenge for the church today is extracting people 
from the yoke of their traditions that hinder their spiritual lives. Men and women who are established in the four basics of the Christian life are the four foundational principles in the Christian life. Remember what they are? Scripture, prayer, fellowship, and witnessing. Folks who are established in those basics will experience a trust in the sovereignty of God. And that leads to personal security, which reduces the need to control or to limit what God is doing. A secure person enjoys the creative spirit of God and looks forward to the next invasion of the supernatural into his or her daily life. Jesus simply would not bow down to these counterproductive traditions. He spoke out against them as a stumbling block that creates more trouble than they're worth. And when traditions get in the way of the mission of the church, we need to seriously re-examine them. There is something basically wrong with continuing traditions that have lost their meaning or their effectiveness. Why continue to invest in something that no longer matters, that no longer works? The Bayer Corporation, by the way, stopped putting cotton wads in their genuine Bayer bottles. The company realized that the aspirin would hold up just fine without the padding of white clumps, which it had included since 1914. And just a few years ago, they quit putting this in there. We concluded that there really wasn't any reason to keep the cotton except tradition, said Chris Allen. Vice President of Bayer's Technical Operations. Besides, he went on to say, it's hard to get out. You ever tried that? It is hard to get out. I have to take a knife or a fork and get it out of there. No fingernails. I bite them off all the time. Anyway, long-standing traditions in the church often are more of a hardship than they are help. Pharisee's problem. Still with us today, folks. Their security was in their traditions, not in trusting God. Not entrusting God. So when Jesus came along, they could not accept Him because that meant that they would have to give up on their traditions. And many churches fail to get in on what God is doing because we fall back on, our, on certain traditions and practices rather than embracing a new thing that God may be doing. Rather than trust God and find new, fresh, creative, more effective, and frankly, more biblical ways of accomplishing our mission and increasing our ministry, we fall back on traditions and things that used to work because they make us feel comfortable. Church, the way that Jesus does it, inspires trust in the sovereign God who controls all things and can accomplish anything. The United States Department of, of Transportation spent $200 million a few years ago to, uh, for research and testing of an automated highway system. I want you to listen closely to this. And think about how you feel about this. The system would purportedly relieve traffic woes with super cruise control in heavily congested cities. Special magnets embedded in the asphalt every four feet would transfer signals between the vehicles and main computer systems. Steering, acceleration, and braking would be controlled by sensors, computers, navigation systems, and uh, cameras along the side of the road. Control would then be returned to the drivers at when they reached their specified exit. Researchers and government officials claim that they have the technology, the technological capability to address any potential problem except one. Yeah, there's one potential problem they had yet to be able to address. Says Mike Doble, GM's technology manager, the only thing we can't do yet is to get people to comfortably trust the system. I'm one of those, by the way. 
He said, it's not a technology issue. Would you drive closely spaced at high speeds through San Diego or Atlanta or any of the other places? Trust is always the issue. As long as we trust our traditions, we will never be challenged to trust God. Thirdly, church the way that Jesus did it is to invest in ministry itself, not in the mechanics of ministry. The Pharisees' strategy was to protect, maintain the organization at all costs, now get this, including crucifying their own Messiah. That's the way it comes out. The Pharisees invested time, energy, and resources in keeping their traditions intact, their structure secure, and especially their status unchanged. Jesus invested in meeting needs wherever he found them. Jesus invested in ministry. He was constantly being confronted by this religious establishment of his day. The master encountered, as most of his disciples will, opposition from certain religious quarters. Disciples on the front lines for Jesus are often jabbed in the back. This was the very problem that Jesus himself faced in verses 23 through 28. Look at those verses. Jesus broke all the rules set up, the rules were set up, by the Pharisees. They then proceeded to attack him with a vengeance. And Jesus answered to them, conveyed the idea that human need takes precedent over human law. The Sabbath, Jesus indicates to us here, was designed to give humankind enjoyment not to confine his spirit by some oppressing rules. The rules of the Pharisees, however, were subtle man-made rules, and most of the rules concerning the Sabbath, the Pharisees made up whole cloth sometimes, creating guilty, frustrated, but unhappy legalists. They were designed to keep ministries from actually happening rather than making ministry possible. Now, in the passage that we just read, shortly after the grain-picking incident, Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. He then proceeded in sight of all to heal a man who had a withered hand. And as he had the man to stretch out his hand, Jesus seemed to be saying indirectly to the Pharisees, I will move toward human need regardless of your obsession with tradition and your misunderstanding of God's law. And in the process, Jesus was determined to, te determined to teach his followers of the priority of meeting needs. Whatever it takes to reach people with the gospel of mercy a disciple does it. Thus, in order to be effective in fulfilling the Great Commission, we must learn to do church the way Jesus did it. Far too many churches today make the mechanics of ministry, the bureaucracy of ministry, the ministry itself. That has to change. Now, folks, we don't have this problem. But it is a problem that can occur at any time without us hardly noticing it. I've seen people with their hearts on fire rise quickly to leadership in a local church, but after a steady dose of organizational, administrative headaches, the fire goes out and their hearts grow cold. Jesus modeled for us the right priorities. Scripture, prayer, fellowship, witnessing. But he also modeled for us ministry, meeting the needs of human beings. That's what's important. When I was a student at Southwestern Seminary, Dr. Robert Naylor was the president. He retired after my first year there. In fact, I wondered if there were, might be something wrong with me because after my first two years at Southwestern, nine of the professors left the school after I took their class. I don't know what that meant. Anyway. One day, some of us were sitting around talking, and Dr. Naylor 
pulled up a chair and joined our informal discussion. At one point, someone asked him, Dr. Naylor, what do you do when your heart grows spiritually cold? Won't you think where you are this morning? He said, when I was pastor at Travis Avenue Baptist Church, which is a large church in Fort Worth at the time, I would find myself at times cold spiritually. I would get in my car, and I would go to the house of a person that I knew was lost. I would share Christ with him and see him born again spiritually as he gave his life to Jesus. Then Dr. Naylor concluded, I would get back in my car and I would sing all the way home. The cold had been melted by the joy God gives when he sees people saved, changed. Nothing will warm up the believer than leading another person to Christ. And folks, he's right. Cold hearts are set on fire when God uses us in ministry in the real business of the church. And that is seeing God change lives. When we're involved in that, your heart, if it's cold, will warm up quickly. Let's pray about it. Our Father, many of us came this morning with our hearts just not on fire. And for many of us, that's a all too often common condition. And my prayer this morning is that here in your word, your son reveals to us our hearts can catch the fire once again. When you're using us in such a way that you are changing lives, our hearts will be warm again. My prayer this morning is that we will continue to investigate, we will continue to learn, we will continue to implement the ways of doing church, the way that Jesus did it, the way he wants it done today. And I pray, Father, for all of us, we won't see change as the enemy. Not all changes are good. But we won't see change as the inner, inner enemy, but as an opportunity to see you do something new, something fresh, something creative in our lives and in our churches. So may you work in the hearts of us all to create these new opportunities to do something new in us as individuals and in us as a church. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to finish a little differently than we normally do because our grammar had to leave and be someplace and we decided to change it around so uh, be reminded we're not going to have evening worship tonight but just tonight we're not going to have it and uh, I appreciate all of you making the effort to set your clocks back last night and get here on time be here today hope you have a good afternoon thank you for being here Oh, yeah, sit, go ahead, t sit, stay seated. I thought y'all were doing that while I was talking.